Welcome to the History Maestro. Let's dive into the exceptional life of Mansa Musa and find out if he was just a king or more a god. The legendary Mansa Musa, a name that rings through history, emerged around 1280 AD in the majestic Mali Empire in West Africa. Musa wasn't just any name, it echoed the biblical Moses across Jewish, Christian, and Islamic traditions. His dad, Fagaleh, had a lineage that was nothing short of epic, being the grandson of Abu Bakr, the hero behind Mali's rise to greatness alongside his brother, the empire's founder Mansa Sundi Adakeda. This family was at the heart of the Muslim Keda dynasty, a powerhouse in what's now Guinea. Fast forward, and we see Sundiata, the first Mansa, flexing his military muscles, expanding the empire's reach into present-day Senegal and Gambia. While Musa's dad's life is a bit of a mystery, we know he didn't wear the crown, but his descendants, including Musa, would lead Mali through its golden ages and tough times between the 13th and 15th centuries. As for Musa's mom, Kanku, details are sparse. Women in Mali back then were powerhouses in their communities, skilled in everything from pottery to science, despite historians often overlooking their voices. Now, let's dive into the nitty-gritty of Mali's roller coaster history. Before Mali's glory days, the Ghana Empire was the big shot until it took a nosedive around 1180 due to droughts, civil wars, and the rise of the Sasso Empire. But the tides turned when Sundiata, the underdog turned Lion King, rose up, united several kingdoms, and kicked off the Mali Empire after whooping Samaro at the Battle of Kerna in 1235. Sundiata's reign was legendary, leaving behind a legacy of unity, innovation in agriculture, and the Kurukan Fuga laws, part of Mali's constitution even today. After Sundiata came Mansauli, who took Mali's fame even further, reaching cities like Timbuktu. Yuli's pilgrimage to Mecca before his sudden death set the stage for a family drama of succession that would see Wadi and Khalifa jostle for the throne, with Khalifa's brief, tumultuous rule ending in a coup. Enter Badamande Bori, aka Abu Bakr, bringing a brief peace before Sakura, possibly a royal insider or a misunderstood slave, took over. His reign saw Mali's trade and territory expand, challenging perceptions of slavery and racism within the empire. Mansa Musa's story and the Mali Empire saga are a whirlwind of power plays, military conquests, and a rich cultural heritage that reshaped West Africa forever. Exciting, isn't it? Mansa Sakura, on his grand return from a hajj to flaunt power and devotion, meets a twist of fate near a place called Tajura, now part of Libya. The tale takes a dark turn with whispers of an inside job by Chu, a relative with ambitions, leading to Sakura's unfortunate demise around 1300. This twist of fate handed Chu, a nephew with royal blood, the keys to the kingdom. His reign, though short-lived at five years, opened the stage for his son Muhammad ibn Chu and then, the star of our story, Musa, a young royal dynamo in the making. Fast forward a bit, and Muhammad, with an explorer's heart, launches a daring 400-ship voyage westward, fueled by dreams of undiscovered lands. Only one ship returns, its captain spinning tales of a mighty ocean river that swallowed the rest. But rather than dampening Muhammad's spirit, it stokes the fire for another try. So, in 1312, Muhammad sets sail again, leaving Musa in charge, a decision that would shape the Mali Empire's future. Musa wasn't just warming the throne, he was reshaping the empire. Under his watch, the palace in Niani transformed into a buzzing royal hub, and he was all about bringing out the best in his people, from rewarding royal governors to sending students to Morocco for a top-notch education. He had a knack for leadership, ruling with wisdom from his majestic ebony throne, surrounded by the grandeur of elephant tusks and a court that was the heart of the empire. The mystery of Muhammad's final voyage and those two thousand ships vanished into the Atlantic Fools
News and exotic goods were flowing in from places as far away as China, making it feel like they were living their own version of the Renaissance. Imagine markets bustling with the coolest stuff from all over the world. Musa was a genius at controlling the Sahara trade. He made sure those trade routes were as peaceful as a town city, turning the Mayan Empire into the superstar power of the 14th century. He even set up this epic network of poor towns where traders could swap goods like they were collecting trading cards. And guess what? They even started using camels and donkeys strategically for transport, depending on the region. One super cool fact was that a pound of salt was worth its weight in gold. Mali was swimming in gold, and these poor towns were where the magic happened, ensuring Musa got his fair share of taxes. Musa was also big on horses and knew they were keen in warfare. He built an army with around 10,000 cavalry and a total force of 100,000 warriors. That's like having the third largest army in the world at the time. This guy was so into his demons and offerings, he went on raids and boasted about traveling cities. To keep his army top notch, he ensured they had the best weapons made by the most skilled blacksmiths, who were like the rock stars of the time because of their middle work gifts from the god Odin. Fast forward to 1324, Wilson decided to go on a great trip to Mecca, taking a massive crew of 60,000 people, including soldiers and soldiers, decked out in the dance of the chugging 25 gallons in one go. Despite the harsh conditions, Musa S. crew managed to find water spots, keep everyone fed, entertained, and making steady progress across the vast desert by following the stars and wind patterns of the sand. The route from Yanni to Cairo was nothing short of epic. Upon reaching Cairo, a city buzzing with about a million people and rich culture, Musa's entourage, decked in lavish outfits, called the White Strip. Gold shimmered everywhere, making their arrival at the site Cairo they had never seen before. Moose's refusal to face the Sultan's hand initially caused a bit of a stir, but was swiftly resolved, leading to feasts and exchanges of gifts, showcasing the grandeur of Moose's money empire. Their stay in Egypt was a hit. Moose's generosity with gold gifts was so legendary it actually tanked the gold market prices for years. Attempts to stabilize the market by buying back gold highlighted the vast wealth and economic power of the world. After a revolution to the great, the caravan moved the road again, heading toward the city of the world. Reaching the world of God, teaching the world of God to the city of God, Musa embraced humility and joy in the prayers, rituals, and feasts of the head, solidifying his status as a head. Despite a new scuffle with some rowdy pilgrims, Musa's diplomacy shone through, maintaining peace and generosity throughout the visit. Word of Musa's magnificence and the abundance of gold spread like wildfire. His journey back to Mali was paved with invitations to scholars to join him in enriching his empire further. But his heart remained in Mecca, hoping one day to return. By the time they looped back to Cairo, the buzz about Musa's wealth had reached every corner of the known world. to Musa's empire. Despite challenges, including extortionate trade deals and the hardships of desert travel, Musa's return journey was marked by pragmatism and a steadfast commitment to his empire's prosperity. His adventures not only showcased the wealth and power of Mali, but also Musa's profound devotion and strategic brilliance. One cool night, Musa and his crew were chilling in the desert. Musa's got this wild idea and says, they fabric, let's dig a massive trench, surround it with a wall, and call it our secret swimming spot, all for water being found in an oasis nearby. We even used this slip to write down well and good to make a river like Jesus. Imagine the scene when Henry and her 500 strong squad of ladies woke up and jumped right
right in. Fast forward to 1325. Musa hears through the grapevine that his general said Manta just snagged out from the song pocket, expanding Mommy's turf even more. It's like a game of thrones, but Musa is playing cool. Malian style. Cool, sturdy, and setting architectural trends. Next stop, Timbuktu. Moose is digging the vibes, but, again, the mosque just isn't doing it for him. So, he decides to build the Jinga River Mosque and kickstarts a leap in person. Timbuktu starts buzzing with scholars and traders and becomes the hot spot for Islamic education. This man, Musa, was not just about dollars. He's pumping money into cities, making them shine with culture, education, and incredible architecture that's still standing strong. Two lucky men are the crown jewel of the Mali's empire, a beacon of trade and knowledge. Finally, after all this epic journey and city boosting, Musa cruises back to the end of his sky and gets a hero's welcome. He dies with the project, splashing color and grandeur everywhere, uplifting cities across his empire. complicated family tree with at least four wives and an undisclosed number of kids, bucking the trend by choosing his son Magan over his brother as his successor. Under Magan's brief rule, Mali faced challenges, but none as severe as when Simon took over, maintaining Mali's glory at its peak. Yet, all empires have their drama, and Suleiman's reign was no exception, with palace intrigues and external threats shaking up the scene. Flash forward, and we witness the beginning of the game for Mali. Territory slipping away and wants radiant cities to fall prey to invaders. Despite this, Mansa Musa's legacy is possibly the richest person in his countries, even if scholars begin the exact truth. What's truly fascinating is how Mansa Musa's tale, a blend of fact and legend, has survived through the ages, inspiring everything from video games to blockbuster movies. Timbuktu flourished under his rule, becoming a mythical city of wealth and knowledge. So there you have it, the incredible story of Mount Samusa, a game of hope is our shame. What do you guys think? Is he one of the most significant figures in West African history? A mighty king or more the status of a god? Drop your thoughts below and thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.